Hello everyone. Hello. Hello. So before I actually start, I'm going to ask you to guess what my talk is going to be about just from reading that title, apart from my friends, because <laughs> they already know the, um, the topic. So yeah, just shoot, any Climb, questions? Climbing a mountain. Sorry? Climbing a mountain. Yes, which one? Mount Sorry? Mount Blanc. No, not that one. Mont Blanc. Yes, Mont Blanc. <laughs> so yes, I'm going to talk about Mont Blanc, which peaks at 4,810 meters making it the highest peak in the Alps. So everyone knows Mont Blanc is dangerous, right? Sadly, between 5 and 10 people lose their life every year. And yet, it is also a relatively accessible summit, making it a very popular climbing destination. In fact, every summer, around 20,000 Climbers try to reach the summit, and only 60% of them will make it to the top for a nice sunrise. <laughs> but obviously, you don't climb Mont Blanc just to see a nice sunrise, do you? <laughs> so why do people want to climb it? <laughs> In a minute, you're, <laughs> you're going to see that people can be driven by so many different motivations when it comes to climbing Mont Blanc. But first, when you think about Mont Blanc, you don't think about money, do you? Well, actually, think twice. It was first conquered in 1786 by um, two French men who were not drawn by passion, but by a cash prize. They were actually given a reward to climb it. I don't know if you can see on the picture, but the equipment was very basic at the time. Quite different from the equipment these people had back in 2007. These guys decided to um, throw a jacuzzi party at the top. I'm quite impressed actually because they had, each of them had to carry 20 kilos of equipment, plus wine and beer obviously. <laughs> but for the, the crazier thing to bring at the top, I think the prize should go to a British guy who back in September wanted to raise money for a charity. So, so far, so good. And therefore, decided to climb Mont Blanc while carrying a roaring machine, <laughs> as everyone does. <laughs> so not only did he carry the machine, but he left it halfway to the top and went back to the UK without the machine, you cannot imagine the anger of French people. Yeah. I mean, Brexit was bad enough for your reputation, <laughs> now we officially hate you guys. <laughs> Last but not least, another motivation would be to spend time and get closer to a particular person. In my case, my big brother. So may I introduce you to Guillaume, or William in English? So this is me and my brother, oh. when we were younger, <laughs> yeah, I'm the chubby one. <laughs> um, as kids, we got on very, very well. I know it doesn't really show on the picture, but we had fun together. But as we became adults, we kind of lost that deep bond. And life got in the way and we don't really see each other that often. And. Yeah, so we, we don't really yeah we don't really see each other that often, and um, I lost what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, he lives basically he lives in France he lives in France and I live in the uh, here in the UK, so we can't really see each other that often. And and then one day, exactly a year ago, my brother phoned me, which is quite unusual, and he said. Lorraine, do you want to climb Mont Blanc with me next year? Mm. Just like that, out of the blue. And, well, just like that, she out did. of the blue, I said, well, yeah, of course. I just wanted to spend some time with him. I didn't really care about the destination. So there I was, committed to climb the highest peak in the Alps with some serious training to plan. So I started the training 
back in January 2019, meaning I had six months to be ready for the climb boot in June. So I got really excited and I was running up to um, four times a week around Hastings and hiking in the South Downs. And I was carrying my backpack that I was stuffed with a few stones to reach 11 kilos. So I went a bit crazy. And I also wanted to know how my body would react to a high altitude. But there's no mountain around here. So I took part, part in a hypoxic chamber test, which took place um, at the university just down the road, by the way. And Long story short, I was, I was just in a room <coughs> for a day with low oxygen level. Well, let me tell you something. After seven hours, I had all the symptoms of altitude sickness, which felt like a really bad hangover. So after all this intensive training, finally came the time to fly to France. So, um, as my brother and I aren't professional mountaineers, we had booked a five-day package with a French agency, which consisted in a three-day climb, a three-day training, followed by the two-day climb with the guide. So, during the training, I was in a group of nine male climbers, and we all learned how to use crampons, ice axe around the glaciers. We were working up to eight hours a day. It was back to basic. So no shower for three, for three days, sleeping in cold dawns, waking up at dawns with temperatures below zero. But because we were in France, the food was just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, after all of this, the weather turned dramatically and the climate had to be cancelled. Yeah. I was disappointed too. We were all so disappointed, we even tried to convince our guides to let us climb, however bad the weather was. We nearly went on strike. But in the end, my brother and I had to reschedule the ascent later in August. Unfortunately, yet again, the weather conditions were too bad to actually make the attempt. So, my brother and I had to reschedule the ascent a third time in September. And third time lucky, the conditions were just about right. So this is the normal route to the top, which normally takes two days. In our case, we only had one day to climb Mont Blanc before the weather would get worse, meaning we had no time to acclimatize to altitude, no time to rest at the refuge, the Gute Hut, and barely any time to stop for food. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> <laughs> so on the 4th of September, my brother, our guide, and I started our long journey, or shall I say race, to the top. Now, looking back, I feel that the first part, so the, that, that would be the first part up to the Gute Hut, the first part was actually quite easy, <coughs> even though we had to cross the Death Corridor. So this huge gully is actually famous for its constant rockfalls and is usually compared to a game of Russian roulette. So I'm going to show you a short video. So we actually had to crop to run it. <laughs> so after the death corridor, we had to climb boulders and, and big rocks for two hours before we finally arrived at the refuge, this amazing spaceship-like hut. Is it working? Yeah. Wow. There we are. Everyone stop there but us. <laughs> we, just, we just had some time to put my crampons on, clipped into the rope with my brother and our guide, and off we went for the real deal. Now, do you remember I said that it was quite easy at first? Well, after walking for a few hours, 
in the snow at high altitude is not easy anymore. <laughs> it became a real struggle. You know when you dream that you want to run, but you cannot make your legs move as fast as you want them to? Well, it felt the same. Especially as we were going up one summit just to discover another one to climb endlessly. To me, each summit looked like just a giant wall of snow standing in front of me. It was hell. But I had to keep up with the pace. I was part of a team up there, so I couldn't let anyone down especially my brother. <coughs> I mean, I didn't care about the summit, but I knew how important it was for my brother. So quitting was not an option. So I decided to come up with some coping strategies. So I stopped looking at the landscape. I refused to look further for the Hopfield summit, and I looked down at my feet. And then I started crying. <laughs> and was hoping that no one would actually notice. What I didn't know at the time is that my brother, who was just behind me, he was actually struggling too. <laughs> but because I didn't, well actually he, he was struggling and he wanted to turn back. <laughs> but because I didn't communicate about my own distress, he didn't either. And because we didn't say anything to each other, well, we pushed on. And that's how we managed to reach the summit. <laughs> so, unlike everything you've been told, no communication is the key to success. <laughs> so, this is us at the summit. So, at the top, you have this amazing 360 view onto the Alps. Well, the irony is that you train for eight months for a 10 minute selfie break. <laughs> it's actually too cold up there to stay any longer. So after a few selfies, some uh, hugs and even more crying, we started our race back to the hut to make it on time for dinner. Now, I was so tired that I don't remember much of the descent. I don't. I was just in the zombie mode. The only thing I do remember, though, is that we all stopped for a wee. I'm sure you're happy to be here. <laughs> so I was about to remove my harness and find a place where I could not be seen. A bit hard on one thing. And when the guy turned and said, we haven't got time, just do it here now. So there I was, <laughs> facing the summit, turning my back to a sheared rope, with my brother on my left, the guide on my right, just a metre away from me, all rubbed up. This is not how I imagined to be closer to my brother. <laughs> <laughs> so after these 11, well, after this eventful 11 hour journey, we finally arrived at the refuge. I was done. <laughs> I looked at my brother and I said, never, ever, ever again. <laughs> and I think he agreed. <laughs> so the next day, it was once again a race back to town to catch a train. So once we'd made it, the guy gave us a certificate of achievement and we bought a Mont Blanc t-shirt. Now it's funny because my brother framed his certificate, and mine is just hidden in a drawer next to my t-shirt. I actually realized that I've never worn that t-shirt. So, I've brought it here, and I'm gonna wear it tonight for the very first time. So bear with me. So, um, I 
I'm really, I, I feel lucky not to have the t-shirt, but to be amongst the 60% of starters to have climbed Mont Blanc. But to be honest with you, sharing my story with you tonight and standing in front of you feels more terrifying <laughs> than climbing Mont Blanc in just one day. <laughs> I, I <just> <laughs> So I, I'm actually quite pleased um, of what I've achieved during this eight amazing month, which is reconnecting with my brother. It has definitely changed our relationship. And now we're even thinking of our next challenge. And hopefully this time I'll get to choose. I'm open to any suggestions, by the way. Thank you.